so much drunk. One of the most fun things about diving into a console's game library is discovering games on your own that seemingly nobody else has talked about or mentioned. It's always nice to find something good without having been hit over the head with the advertising sledgehammer over and over again. So what I thought I'd do is talk about the games I've found on my own on Nintendo Switch that I think more people should check out. There's 30 games in this video, and I've tried to play as many different genres and styles as I could over the years, so the choices are all over the map. I should mention that not all of these games are exclusive to the Switch, but if nothing else, you can use this video to add stuff to your wish list for the next big sale, wherever that may be. Switch is where I played these games, so that's what I'm sticking with for this video. Starting with platformers, Blue Fire is an impressive game that borrows from the visual style of Hollow Knight, as well as the hack and slash gameplay of a 3D Zelda game. I found the jump and dash to be quick, responsive, and really easy to use, and the camera wasn't an issue either. The levels are challenging, the boss fights are fun, and while there's a good amount of backtracking in this game, it's still a solid title, and I was able to pick this one up for 5 bucks, and for that price, for an 8-10 to 10 hour playthrough, this game is well worth it. Spelunky 2 is a challenging roguelite platformer, and you don't need to play the first game to enjoy this one, but it certainly doesn't hurt. This is a really fast-paced game in a similar vein to something like Risk of Rain or Vampire Survivors, and despite everything being randomized for every playthrough, what really shines in this game is the level design. Everything always seems to fit together perfectly in each playthrough. Granted, this game is really, really hard, and that might push some people away, but I still think it's worth a try. Flynn's Son of Crimson is a story-driven action platformer where you destroy everything in your path across a huge world. And it's a linear game, but there's still plenty of stuff to unlock with multiple paths you can find. The combat in this one is really satisfying, especially once you have your dog with you. I do have to say, the exploration in this game can get kind of boring, there's about a million NPCs to talk to, but strictly as an action platformer, this game is a good time. It's about a 7 or 8 hour playthrough, and it usually goes on sale for something like $5. I'll mention a more mainstream game I'm sure you've heard of, Rayman Legends. It's a much older game than the others on this list, but I bring it up because I think people sleep on just how freaking good it is. If you flew through Mario Wonder and Mario 3D World and Bowser's Fury, and you're looking for more of that kind of energy with that kind of crazy level design, then you should be playing Rayman Legends. The definitive edition is out on Switch, and it's a high quality playthrough from start to finish. If you want more of a horror-themed action platformer, then there's Slain Back From Hell. Ever want to rip apart demons and monsters with your sword set to some 80s thrash metal? Hey, who doesn't? This game brings the carnage, but it's not too difficult. It can look kind of bleary at times to the point where it's hard to see, but the good outweighs the bad here, and this is a game that regularly goes on sale and is occasionally listed for free, so pick it up then if you like what you see. I want to mention a couch co-op game since those seem to be few and far between. Overcooked 2 is a cooking simulation where you and up to three other players have to chop, fry, and bake while avoiding fires, collapsing floors, and dealing with annoying waiters. You have to work together to cook recipes while uh, flying in this needlessly complicated hot air balloon. It's a fun time though, it's got easy to learn controls, and it has that addictive quality you look for in a couch co-op game. There's no shortage of good racing games on the Switch. Fast RMX is an easy recommendation, and there's a ton of content in this one. It's got all the courses and DLC from the game that preceded this, Fast Racing Neo, and it includes six new courses for a total of 30 altogether. The main gimmick here is the polarity mechanic, where you boost energy by switching colors, with each color having its own boosts and jump pads, so you gotta be quick on when to use what color at which spot. There's also couch co-op for up to four players, and as you can see, this game just looks fantastic. It's kind of like a cross between F-Zero and Wipeout, so if you're into those games, this is an easy recommendation. And now for a racing game that's completely off the wall. Thumper is a rhythm-based racing game, and I'm not even sure if I need to say anything here. This game is insane to look at, and it's easy to get the basic gist of the gameplay right away. This reminds me of Rez for Sega Dreamcast. You have to match everything you do to the beat of the music, and once you get hooked, it's hard to put down. This is one of those games where an hour can go by in what feels like five minutes. If you like combat racing, or namely the old Road Rash series, then there's Road Redemption, and I love this game. It's total craziness. The physics are good enough for this to be a legit fun playthrough, but there's plenty of laugh-out-loud wonkiness here. Like, I'm trying to plant some C4 on this truck, and I end up grabbing the truck instead. Whoops. One thing I like to do is just get behind two cars and just watch them plow into oncoming traffic. 
There's guns, tasers, sledgehammers, missile launchers. Sometimes it rains cars. It's a great time. I think I've put close to 40 hours into this one at this point. Sticking with combat racing, I want to give Burnout Paradise Remastered a shout out as well. It may not be the best in the series, and the open world concept is kind of annoying, but it's still Burnout. There's still ridiculous stunts and lots of cars to unlock, and you get to hop around as a crumpled ball of flaming wreckage causing every other car that touches you to explode. Okay, full disclosure, I'm really adding this to this video because I'm starving for a new Burnout game. But Paradise on Switch is still a good game to wishlist and wait for a sale, at, at the very least. For first-person shooters, there's Project Warlock. Now, is this game going to compare to stuff like Doom Eternal or Destiny 2? No. But hey, it's hard to complain about dropped frames when this is a throwback-style game that takes influence from something you might see from Apogee or id Software. There's plenty of weapons, plenty of enemy types, and plenty of maps. So if you're looking for a game where you hit ghouls in the face with a hand axe, then here you go. Let's switch it up and talk about some action-based role-playing games, starting with CrossCode. And there may be no game where you get more bang for your buck than this one. CrossCode is at least a 40-hour game, and the world and the story are gigantic, and it's one of those games where you can shoot everything, go everywhere, and check everything, and you kind of have to to get through this one since there's so much here. The game plays like a top-down shooter like Pocky and Rocky, only with the structure of a role-playing game. There's a combo rank system, a ton of skills to learn, a trading system, and there's a ton of gear to trade. Plus, the game just looks and sounds freaking awesome. Definitely check this game out. If you'd rather play an action RPG that's closer to an NES game, there's Odalis The Dark Call, not to be confused with former Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Odalis Perez. This one has some great looking enemy designs, some fantastic pixel art, with nine huge levels to explore. If you like games like Symphony of the Night or Bloodstained, you might like this one. It's a little simpler, but that makes it more focused. Odalis is one of those games where it's clear that it's made by people who don't want to simply replicate older games, they want to expand and improve them, and Odalis does just that. If you want a more modern action RPG, then you might like Morbid the Seven Acolytes. And yeah, take one glance at this one and you can tell what it's about. It's like Dark Souls with the camera viewpoint of Secret of Mana. This game checks all the boxes. You've got hideous monster design, tons of gore, a deliberately vague story that doesn't get in the way. Everything is dark and gray and black and blood red, but most importantly, the game is just fun to play. I will say it's kind of slow paced, which might frustrate some people. And of course the obvious Dark Souls influence also means the game is really, really hard. But if you're patient, it's a good playthrough. Moving on to the run and gun genre, you can't go wrong with Hunt Down. There's three playable characters you can use to get through 20 levels with hand-drawn animations and an art style straight from games like Contra 3. There's couch co-op or online co-op, and the game has a sense of humor. Like here, you get a boss that sounds like Randy Savage, or is that Leonard Ghostel? Again, this is another game where it's clear the people who made it love games like this, so if you do too, then you can't go wrong here. Vengeful Guardian Moonrider was created by the same folks who made Blazing Chrome, another excellent run-and-gun game, and while I don't think Moonrider is quite as good as that game, it's still a well-made title with great controls. There's only eight levels here, but that's plenty because this game packs a really tough challenge. I'm not even sure what I'd pick between this and Hunt Down, so hey, why not recommend both? If you want to slow things down with a more strategy-based game, there's Bad North. I was able to pick this one up for like $2, and while the premise may not be much, it's got an addictive quality to it. You're tasked with moving around groups of soldiers to defend an island from enemy invaders. You can eventually level up your groups and separate them into close-range and long-range fighters, and I always found myself saying, just one more island. Then before I know it, it's like a dozen more islands and 30 minutes have gone by. Let's stick with cheap games. Sometimes the problem with finding games online is that it feels like there's an endless number of them to sort through, so what I did was pick a few that are always super cheap, and while they may not win Game of the Year or even Game of the Week, they're still at least decent pick-up-and-play games if you're looking to just stave off boredom. A good example of what I mean is Goblin Sword. This game was two bucks, and it's a very simple exploration platformer. Not exactly the most original or inventive game, but it doesn't need to be. It's closer to a game like Wonder Boy and Monster World, not quite as good, but it's still decent enough. I also rolled the dice on this one called Minute of Islands, although $2 isn't much of a dice roll, but it's a simple puzzle platformer with an interesting art style, and at the very least, when picking up games like this, I know now to look for titles from developer Studio Fizbin, because there's some good ideas here. 
Another game I randomly found for $2 was Deflector, just a crazy hack and slash game that looks insane and it has a weird combo system Now I'm not sure I understand, but who cares because it's fun to just kill stuff in games like this, and hey, it'll stimulate your eyeballs if nothing else. Again, these titles aren't gonna exactly shake your world, but if you're looking for something new to play over a weekend, they're decent choices that won't set you back much. I'll mention a couple sports games, starting with Super Mega Baseball 4, and I like this one because it's not trying for any realism, it's not trying to be a simulation, it's just an arcade-style baseball game that cuts a quick pace, and it may remind one of a certain Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball. No, really, I'm not just saying that because I love that game, I'm saying it because pitching and hitting are easy to get the hang of, and fielding can be fun too, especially when you got guys like Torrey Hunter in center field. There are some current and former players in this game, and there's plenty of made-up players too with names like Percy Quaker and Dick Sportswood. But yeah, this game's got a lot of personality and it's a good time. Just not for this guy. I'm not sure a game like What the Golf counts as sports because the premise here is that everything is golf. I mean, yeah, it's technically golf, but it makes every single thing golf. Whether you're an oil barrel avoiding cars trying to smash into you or an office chair dodging enemy gunfire, the goal is always the same, to get an object, no matter what it is, from point A to point B. Sometimes that object might be your own self, and you have to fling your own body across the fairway like a rag doll. This is a really fun one that always provides a few laughs. Near the other end of the spectrum is Golf Story, and it's structured like a role-playing game similar to the old Mario Golf games made by Camelot. So in other words, it's a JRPG-styled game that just happens to be about golf. Of course, that's what most of the gameplay is here, but things are kept really simple with a consistent top-down viewpoint and a three-click swing meter. It's about a 20 or 25 hour playthrough, and hey, sometimes it's nice to just crank through an RPG where instead of the world ending and defeating the evil empire and all that, instead you just worry about dialing in a 9-iron from 120 yards. Of course, there's always games that seem to defy genres, like take a game like Unpacking, for instance. What is this, a moving simulator? I mean, all you're doing is unpacking boxes and putting stuff in its proper spot. But, I mean, it's really addictive, and it's also pretty relaxing thanks to the great soundtrack. I think you have to have a certain personality type to enjoy this one. Some people might think Unpacking is pointless and boring, but I've played through it three different times, and I'm sure I'll play through it at least three more times. Another game I got hopelessly addicted to is Slay the Spire. I really think it's one of the best games of the past 20 years or so, and it spawned all sorts of imitators, some good and some bad, so if you're like me and always on the lookout for roguelite deck builders, then you might like Monster Train. It's structured similarly, but it has its own wrinkle. You're defending three vertical fields in addition to the usual roguelite layout. You pick two clans and one champion and build your deck as you go. This one can get real tough real quickly, but once you get going, it's hard to put down. To finish up here, I'm going to focus on a few remakes, starting with what Square Enix has put out the last few years. Now, Square had a real phase in the mid-90s where seemingly every game they made featured multiple stories or timelines, most famously with Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger, but there were a few similarly scoped titles that stayed in Japan until recently. And no, I know that these aren't quote-unquote hidden gems, really. They're more, uh, I don't know, overlooked Jaspers? Shout out Polymedia. There's been an avalanche of great role-playing games the past few years, so I feel like I need to harp on these in particular, starting with Live Alive. This is a classic case of a game where you think you get the general gist of it, like, oh, hey, neat, it's seven little mini RPGs that come together at the end. But no, once you finish those seven stories, the last act of the game is unlocked, and holy crap, does it pack a punch. I'm going to be giving this game its own video soon, but for now, I'll just say, if you liked all the pertinent Super Nintendo JRPGs of the time, then you owe it to yourself to play through Live Alive. Square also has a remake for Seiken Densetsu 3, otherwise known as Secret of Mana 2, and they named the remake Trials of Mana. In this one, you've got six main character paths to choose from. You pick one and then fill out your party with two other characters, and the story plays out accordingly. This is an action RPG through and through with the kind of hack and slash combat that translates really well today. But if I'm going to be a snob about it, I kind of prefer the original Super Famicom version. I guess it just has a certain look and feel to it that I feel like is missing in the remake. But either way, this is probably the best way to play this game today. 
Square Enix also released Romancing Saga 3 for modern audiences, although this one is a remaster instead of a remake, which is fitting because it just goes to show that this game was ahead of its time when it was made. Romancing Saga 3 stood out from other JRPGs of the time because it tried doing a semi-open world structure to varying degrees of success. But with the remaster, now we've got all kinds of quality of life improvements which helps bring about a much smoother playthrough from beginning to end. If you're itching to tackle a 90s square role-playing game that stayed super under the radar over the years, then here you go. Here's a really fun remake for a franchise that needs a lot more attention. It's Metal Max Xeno Reborn. There are barely any Metal Max games released in English. There's only a few as far as I know, but Xeno Reborn is a lot of fun. Granted, this game was originally released for PC, PS4, and Vita, but the Switch remake is excellent, and it's a much smoother playthrough. You cobble together a tank, go out and fight and earn money, and then buy upgrades that allow you to venture further out into the world. There's missions to complete, land sharks to destroy, and stats on top of stats on top of stats. I really enjoy this game, it's well worth your time. Okami is another game that feels underappreciated somehow, but thanks to the HD remake on Switch, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. I remember playing this one back when it first came out for PS2, and because it was released so close to the launch of the PS3, maybe it got bumped aside a bit, but it's a fantastic game, clearly inspired by titles like Wind Waker and Beautiful Joe. In fact, the lead designer of Beautiful Joe is actually the director here, Hideki Kamiya, who also had a hand in franchises like Bayonetta. But yeah, Okami is awesome. It's a big sweeping story you can easily sink 40 hours into. Combat is easy to get the hang of, the music is great, and I mean, come on, you play through this huge epic story as this cool looking white wolf. You gotta love that. Whew, okay, well, that's all for now. I hope to do a part two soon after Nintendo posts their latest Indie Direct to see if there's anything worthwhile there, and I hope to check some of your comments to see if there's any good suggestions out there as well. But in the meantime, I just want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.